So let's look at a couple more. These are all examples of what turned out to be lymphoma. So if you're looking at this slide, does this look very different than potentially what we looked at earlier? Could it be a necrotic node if you didn't have the context? Looks very similar. Looks very similar. And this was to a, part, a point that Mark brought up before, right? And just looking at it, you can't just look at it. You need some context. Here's another image of lymphoma. And here you can see that there's, again, abnormal architecture. And that's really what I'm trying to demonstrate here is the abnormal architecture. So I think the message when we talk about malignancy is to just understand that a malignancy can, you know, present at any time. But typically when we're going to be most concerned is if something fails antibiotics or if you have it in the context of all these other concerning findings. Okay. Any thoughts of anything we have to talk on there? Mark, anything you want to mention that? I think um, over time, the ones that are more um, obvious for uh, malignancy, you know, when I look at this clip and the clip before it, um, distinguishing that sense of, oh, the, there's a bright area because of inflammatory change and that looks like infiltration becomes something that's very hard to really put into words as to why you feel that difference. But those last two clips, I would say, now to me, I'm like, oh, look at those areas where the node is infiltrated. Um, and that just, I think, comes after a certain amount of, I've seen malignant ones, I've seen necrotic ones. Um, and it's subtle and difficult to, to put into terms exactly how. All right, three, look at all this color. It's amazing. Case number three, 10 month old female complained of left side and neck mass for 48 hours. She has a history of a viral illness for four days. She's been vaccinated, denies fever, trouble opening her mouth. There are the vital signs. So it's kind of this neck mass, but when you put the transducer on it, this is what you see. What are we seeing here? Paratitis. Paratitis. And how is it described classically? Has anybody really seen anything eaten by a moth? Yes. Yeah, really? Some of your sports jackets uh, oh. on the back have, a <laughs> have some holes in them. So this is very classic paratitis. And as you'll recall, I'm not going to go through a whole bunch of the of the anatomy, but this gives you a sense of where the parotid gland is, the sublingual gland, and the submandibular gland. And um, what do they do again? Yeah. Yeah. They're the goob machines. Um, so, you know, when we look and we find that they have, I can never say this really well, sialodenitis, that's the classic word, sialodenitis. Um, the treatment is kind of interesting. So if you were to see this appearance in a parotid gland, what would be your next step? It kind of goes to the integration part. So you see a swelling, the ultrasound, you see this. What are you going to do? The child looks okay. Most of the time, just a well infection. So I think we'll just reassure the parents that supposed to dissolve in a few days. So yeah. anyway, the child looks maybe to find. Make sure that the kid is vaccinated. Because you're worried about potential mumps, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But outside of mumps. If it's what you want, you can see a stone. Stone, and we'll talk about that in a second. When would you introduce antibiotics here? Because my experience has been there's a pretty broad practice variation. And I, I'll tell you from what I've found, I was, and I'll see what Mark thinks and what the rest of you think. Um, if you look at a lot of guidelines, um, paratitis and any inflammation or, or sialodenitis of any of the salivary glands is thought to be kind of multifactorial. So a lot of people will advocate for early clindamycin uh, because you don't know and can't tell if it's bacterial. So the therapy would traditionally be warm massages, hydration, 
uh, Advil. Advil. Um, and then you can suck on something. They always say a non, non-sugary um, sour candy that produces saliva. Um, but that's not how we always practice here. At the nearest point, often we will watch if it's viral. But some lots of providers will treat with clindamycin. What are we really looking for when we ultrasound? One, we want to identify what it is. Two, we want to see if there's peritonitis. But what's the third piece that we're kind of looking for? Abscess, absolutely. So here's just a couple other examples. What else do you notice here when you see it? How would you describe what we're seeing? It's a little bit less mothy to me. Mm -hmm. A little edematous. It looks like a little bit of hot fat. Mm -hmm. So I think there's again a bit of a spectrum in how long and how things look. Here's another example. So we mentioned stones. Stones common in children? No, incredibly rare. Um, but here, and I pulled this still image off Wikipedia. I don't think we have an image even in our bank, but it's a pretty rare thing, but can happen. And if we did find a stone, often the tip off will be a big duct, right? The salivary ducts can look a little bit big, or we'll see the stone in the shadow. And what would be the appropriate course if we identified that? We would involve the ENT. Because then they would, do a, they would do a scope. Mm -hmm. Okay, but one. One. Okay, one can be repeated like this. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. eventually. So just within that dilated mm -hmm. area, you see the bright structure. Now, whether that's an obstructing stone or not, it's like debatable. So pretty rare, not something you're going to see, but something to keep an eye on. So you're kind of identifying what the structure is. You're seeing if there's that parotitis, that moth-eaten appearance that will go with inflammation or infection. You're making sure there's no abscess, and you're making sure there's nothing blocked. All right. What's this? This is the this is a kid who came in and had a neck mass. Where's the mass? Where's the mass? It's the so it's, it's right out side. here on the side the by mm -hmm. the sternocleidal mass there. And it's sitting out here. It's a good question. It's the most important question. Right. Mm -hmm. Brachial cleft says that this is infected. So we have lots of neck masses, thyroglossal duct cyst, brachial cyst. Um, you can have dermoid cysts. We'll show a few fibro fibromatosis coli. So where things are is important. Your physical exam is still kind of important, taking things in context. But I wanted to show you some examples of what structures look like. So this is a brachial cleft cyst again that's infected. So what do you notice about it? What kind of tips you off that it's an assist? Very well encapsulated. Well encapsulated. Right. It just looks too well encapsulated almost to be like a necrotic lymph node. Mm -hmm. And then the position would help you. Here's another look with a flowing brachial cleft cyst. You can see again, pretty well defined. Here's a structure that was found centrally. Thyroglossal duxes. And again, looks like it's pretty well circumscribed, doesn't it?